This was stuff that was taken on the actual day. I think the original bags are inside from the date that they took them off me, which was the morning of the incident, like merely a few hours after. In my head, I'm just having these like flashbacks of that morning and that feeling, like it's a similar feeling to what I have right now, this like emptiness that's just like shooting down me. It makes you relive what happened that morning. Hello, my love, you okay? What's your name, my love? I'm Jade. Jade. Um, in your own time, obviously understand but obviously very traumatic what's happened. Are you able to tell me what's happened, please? Yeah. Um, I was at a friend's birthday party. I went back with a bunch of friends. I remember falling asleep and then I remember waking up and knowing that something had penetrated me. But I felt, like, violated. I, you, I felt really violated. Do you feel like that potentially someone had intercourse with you in any way? I would say that I could feel physically that something had... Has taken place? Yeah. Um, it's Jade, wasn't it? Jade, yeah. Um, right, what we're going to have to do now, Jade, is we have to uh, go through, uh, report this as what we call rape. We're going to have to... Uh, do some forensic stuff, which basically sort of means uh, I know it's not, it might not seem very nice, but we're gonna have to take a mouse swab. What clothes were you wearing at the time? Current attire. Is it including underwear as well? Yes. We're gonna need all them, everything. And I remember like being advised that I need to take my clothes off, and they need to be bagged up. Every single separate item. My trousers, two tops, a bra, my pants, This is really just bringing back those moments of feeling really dirty. There is that sense of shame in, like, what, what could I have done differently to make sure that this didn't happen? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you wake up? Because I was raped while I was asleep. I suffer from sexomnia, they're suggesting. OK, well, I'm not done fighting yet. It's quite nice looking back on these. Had some great times together. Yeah, just enjoying London life really as two young 24 year olds. Isabel is my best friend. She has been with me kind of through absolutely everything. Yeah, growing up, we were inseparable. I don't know, she's always brings out the best in me, I think. She's just genuinely bloody lush. Jade is like a very confident person. She has a super strong moral compass. She's really funny. Yeah, we're basically sisters. So, I mean, there were some pictures that me and Belle had taken at the night. It feels really weird, actually, like, looking back and just thinking my whole life was literally turned upside down after that moment.
On that evening, I went to Isabel's house. It was a Sunday. We decided that she was going to come over to my house at 7 and get ready together. She's always been the one that can do, like, decent makeup. I'm, I'm terrible, so she would always do, like, the little fancy eyeliner flicks, which I could not do myself. We decided that we would literally just show our faces at this party. We met up with my friend Sophie and walked up to the venue. We uh, went to the bar, got ourselves a bottle of Prosecco to share, and we were kind of mingling and chatting in groups. So we were there until the end of service, and I think Belle then decided she was going to go home. She was quite tired. I was still in a bit of a mood to party, if I was completely honest. She was tipsy. We were both were tipsy, but she was, like, totally in control and happy and bubbly and, and you know, just wanted to chat with friends. That's how we left. I left her with her friends. I just remember walking back up here with them. The flat was literally just over here, just to the side of us. Um, we got back to the house for the kind of after party. It was like literally four or five people. <laughs> it wasn't like a huge thing. Um, after a while, um, I was quite tired. People were still listening to music, smoking and having a few drinks, but I fell asleep. And then I woke up. And I felt as if I'd been penetrated. I couldn't tell you what it was. I, I had no idea, but I kind of like looked down and like my trousers were off, um, my underwear, my bra was unpinged and my necklace was broken. I turned around and I could see um, him on the other side of the sofa. I kind of got a bit aggressive and shouty and kind of confronted him saying, like, what the fuck's happened? What's happened? Like, what have you done? And he, he said, like, something a bit odd, I guess, but he did say, um, I thought you were awake. And he kind of just, like, bolted out, basically, and I got my phone and started calling, calling Isabel. She was hysterical and sobbing. Um, and she said, I think I've been raped. When your best friend and your sister says that to you, it's just earth shattering. So I jumped out of bed and tried to calm her down. And she was just hysterical, sobbing, and she threw up. I was on the phone the whole time with her, trying to tell her that she was safe, and she was okay, that it wasn't her fault. Um, and how many minutes it was going to be until she got to my house. <laughs> Sorry. It's, for me, it just feels like an absolute blur coming out of here. It was an absolute blur coming out until I got to your house and you literally just, like, held me. She just doesn't stop crying. And... I got her up to my house and sat her in an armchair and just held her. Yeah. And I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, uh, we should call the police. She said, yes, go on, make the call. And I made the call. Yeah, I was super brave. Super, super brave to make that decision. Thank you for coming with me.
You never have to thank me. His DNA was found, um, so he did, did rape me. Now that it's coming up to when the actual trial date is, and it's the first time I've actually had a date, like an actual countdown to something, really I'm just like absolutely crapping myself. The amount of people that actually get a case to court in these circumstances is just ridiculously low. And I was like, oh my God, it's going, like, this is huge. I don't even know what to expect or how I'm going to feel, as it's not me that's prosecuting, if that makes sense. I'm not prosecuting, it's the state. Therefore, I have no legal contact from a lawyer, a solicitor or anyone, whereas he has had constant insight from his solicitor, giving him advice, kind of what angles are going to go down on this, on this trial, whereas I have no idea. The trial is approaching and it's beginning to feel real. I'm terrified about standing up in front of a jury. I feel like it might help me to see the court where it's all going to happen. This lingering thought of like, oh my God, what's it like? What does a courtroom even look like? Does it look like what it is on TV? Your mind doesn't stop. I think the only thing that gets you through it is having that opportunity to, to get justice for what happened. I don't even know how I'll feel if he doesn't, if he doesn't get found guilty. I received a call yesterday from an officer and it basically stated that I needed to be at a police station for a meeting. I don't even know what they can possibly say so late on in the day. I, I really, I just don't know what to expect. Right. Um, hi. I literally feel so anxious right now. I could vomit at any point. Okay. So I do apologise if I'm just really weird. Yeah, anytime you need to take a break, um, just let us know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. OK, Jade, um, the reason why we're here is, is really just discuss this case. Um, we had a, an expected trial date. During our discussion back in June, I'd also mentioned that the defence were seeking a sleep expert report. Um, because in your, in your video recorded interview, um, you stated that you were a deep sleeper and you previously slept, slept, walked, slept, talked. The defence got a report which uh, suggested that you were in something called a non-REM parasomnic state, where essentially you were acting... How can I put it? You were essentially acting uh, as if you were awake, but you were subconsciously asleep. What their expert suggested is that um, by being in that state, you've engaged in sexual activity, which then sort of resulted in a reasonable belief in consent. I, I know you look very... Fuck is all I have to say. Yeah. What the... <laughs> Sorry. So, Excuse so, my so, language, everyone. Okay. No, no, That's... I, like, fuck. What they're basically saying is that you were in an act of sleep walking and that was kind of giving off signals that sort of led to sexual activity. But how does that tie in with, like, somebody's capacity to consent? So your actions, even though you may not consciously be aware of it, led to him reasonably believing that you were consenting. 
So, sorry to probably like just no, no, fast no, no, forward just, probably just, what you're going to get to in a moment. Yeah. But moving forward from that, is there yeah. going to be further... Is it going to be like, that's it, done, this is not going anywhere? I don't feel that there's a realistic prospect of conviction. So my decision will be to um, stop the case. So there will not be a trial. <sighs> Do you want to take a break? It's all right. Just take it's all right, I'll give you a minute. Oh, the system's so fucked up. Um, this is not a decision which I've come to lightly. There's just no way of trying to salvage this case. I know you said that you're kind of expecting the worst, but it's never easy to hear mm. the worst. It's been dropped. My case has been dropped. And it's, it's a matter of days before the trial's due to start, and it's nothing's happening. And for me, the reasonings behind it, I can't really make head nor tail of it, to be honest. It's mad. And it's heartbreaking. I'm just genuinely so broken. I didn't think this was ever going to be something that could have happened. There's a CPS that let me down and it's making me relive everything. So I've just received my hand-delivered letter basically summarising a meeting I had with the CPS where they essentially dropped my case, hand-delivered by a police officer and it's a sleep specialist concluded that the defence statement is consistent with an attack of sex somnia. He also confirmed that even if he had never previously had an episode of sex somnia, this could have been the first episode. What is sexomnia? Sexomnia is recognised as a rare sleep disorder in which a person engages in sexual activity during their sleep. I've never had anything remotely similar to this kind of thing. Like, this is just bizarre. I can continue to fight this and challenge the CPS decision. I really feel as if they've missed the mark and not investigated this enough. I'm determined to prove the CPS are wrong to drop my case. I've got three months to appeal. With that in front of me, I feel like I need to go home and see my dad. He's always been there for me and I'll never forget calling him to tell him I'd been raped. As a father, you want the best for your child, you want to protect them and stuff like that. And you, uh, in the early stages, you, you feel helpless because you weren't you. It's, it's a life-changing experience, you know what I mean? And I shit myself, to be honest, you know what I mean? It's like, my, is my baby going to come back and be who she was before? But thankfully, uh, you've come through it, so, which is admirable, so brave. But I don't know how you do it. <laughs> 
You don't do these deep and meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> Can you remember any, like, weird sleep issues I had as a kid? We always had a joke that, like, you could hang you up on a washing line and you'd fall asleep. <laughs> I mean, even when we'd go on a car journey, within five minutes of being in the car, you'd be like... <laughs> but the only time I ever um, knew that he'd slept walk was when we were on holiday in Mallorca and that you got up in the night, walked into a... Uh, wardrobe, broke your nose, and then woke up in the morning with a flannel over it and a sort of black and blue nose. Yeah, um, that was like 16, I think, 16, 16 17 yeah, 15, maximum. Yeah, about that, yeah. Do you think I could suffer from sex omnia? No, I, I can't get my head round yeah, how that yeah. has been used as an excuse, but at least put in front of a jury, rather than to drop it at such a late stage. My dad's just as confused as I am about why my case has been dropped. It's clear all this has had an impact on my whole family, not just me. And I'm realising it isn't over yet. I feel like I need to see all the evidence in my case to work out why things went so wrong. As a victim, I have the right to demand that the CPS review their decision. If I'm going to win this appeal, I need to work out for myself how this idea of sex omnia all started. So I've got the footage of um, like my original police interview. The CPS informed me when they dropped my case, it was down to like a history of sleepwalking and sleep talking that I'd kind of touched upon in this video statement. So I kind of wanted to see exactly kind of where things went wrong, where has this kind of notion of sexomnia and sleep issues have come from. And it basically traces back to my first formal interview with the police. This would have been a couple of weeks after the incident. Um, I do kind of have some, like, haze, because it was such a long time ago now. It's quite weird to see myself in that kind of really vulnerable, vulnerable place. So just to clarify, from the point of falling asleep and to the point of waking up on that sofa, there's nothing that you can recall. No. You, you don't know how your clothing's come off. Literally. And how your bra strap's unpinned. Um, in regards to your sort of sleeping and stuff like that, what sort of a sleeper are you? A bloody deep sleeper. A deep sleeper. I went to, went to France with my mother a few years ago and there was a fire alarm at like three in the morning. For the life of me, she was shaking me to wake me up. Okay. I have like, I don't know, I sleep talk and I sleep walk and I'm very much a deep sleeper and I have okay. no recollect, like my partner, when I'm, I snore like a terrible snorer as well, but I sleep talk and I have no recollection. Like he will remember a conversation that he had with me while I was sleeping. Yeah. I would have no recollection of it. He'd be like, Jade, you're talking absolute shit last night and you're sleeping. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And yeah, I don't know. I've always been quite a deep sleeper. So it's my dad and my nan. So I think it might be genetic. I'm like, so... shut up, Jade. Like, don't say anything else. Like, why? Like, I am frustrated at myself for being so kind of frank and open with them. It's like a, less than a minute, I think, of me talking about it. To be honest, like, once saying it, like, I never really looked back on it, like, until they closed the case. I don't know. It's just. Mad frustrating because it can be the smallest, smallest thing that can completely crumble everything around you in this case, or in any case. It was only after the defence saw me talking about sleepwalking in that police interview that sleep experts got involved. Neither of those sleep experts saw me in person, so I'm paying to see my own private specialist for a third opinion. From hearing about sex somnia for the first time quite recently, it's quite, quite an out there thing, and for me, it's something I've never come across before in my life. Um, is this something that, like, definitely exists? Sexomnia does exist. It's a type of sleepwalking behaviour. What 
we do know is that people who have sex somnia tend to have a history of the sex, sexual behavior. It just doesn't occur one night. And the typical person with sex somnia is a male and who has a track record from his bed partners over a period of time who will all report that yeah, he gets me up halfway through the night and has vigorous sexual activity with me. So therefore, I'm very surprised that you have been labelled as having sex somnia. For me, it does feel as if it has been plucked out of, of thin air and like loosely diagnosed from my understanding. The diagnosis of sex somnia was directed at you, the victim of non-consensual sex. Yes, yeah. OK, so that is in, it, in and of itself the first time I've heard something like this occur. The first time you've heard? The first time, because it's usually the perpetrator of the act. So this is exceedingly unusual. I mean, <laughs> as I said, I have no kind of previous history of, of any of my bed partners ever raising any concerns about this in the past. As an adult, have you had any sleepwalking episodes? My last sleepwalking episode would have been at the age of 17. You've never had an episode where you initiated uh, sex from sleep? No. Your history is not typical of someone with sex somnia. You, you fall in the bracket where 20 to 30 percent of people fall into it, that they have a history of nocturnal behaviors, that they outgrow. The next step would be to get your sleep tested, and then we can take it forward from there. Dr. Ebrahim said this is the only time he's ever heard of a case like mine. It seems it's a first. I feel like I need to look into this. I think not just for me, it's something so much bigger and it's a really incredibly dangerous precedent that the CPS are, are potentially setting for future rape cases. I've been told that most people with sex somnia are men who have repeated episodes, but that's not me. I feel like I need to hear firsthand from someone who actually does have sex somnia. I have found people posting anonymously about having it. Do I have sex somnia? My boyfriend has sex somnia. Sex somnia, how to deal with it in a relationship. I really do want to speak to somebody that does have it. And a guy has agreed to meet me. He says that he didn't know he had sex somnia until his girlfriend told him. So during an episode, I do act differently. I'm quite uncoordinated, I'm quite dead-eyed and glassy-eyed, I'm not very uh, talkative, um, and that's how we know that it's, it's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm sleep, having, having sex in my sleep. And, and what kind of things happen? So I'm resting completely unconscious, uh, but then my body will take over and start trying to, I don't know how to phrase this properly, um, basically my hand will go down my partner's pants while I'm sleeping or while she's sleeping. Um, and then it either stops or it can progress. If she wakes up and, and doesn't want that, isn't happy with it, then she can pull my hand away or push me away really easily and then I stop. Um, but I would have zero recollection of that happening whatsoever. Um, I wouldn't know that happened unless she told me the next morning. And I, I've asked her to tell me any time that there is an episode so that I can check in with her, make sure she's okay with it. It was very confusing at first uh, because I couldn't work out why my body was doing things that it wouldn't do in real life. And it was, um, there, there were times where I was scared and a bit worried about would I do something that really hurts me or more importantly, would I do something that really hurts someone else? It is not my mind, it's not who I am as a person, it's my body. And my body is involuntarily doing something to someone else. It's life-changing for me in the fact that I've been having this suggestion and I can't imagine, like, it must be hugely life-changing for you that actually is like a sufferer of it or has the condition. This is the first time that I've really spoken about it in, in detail. So I don't know if I've really ever had time to sit and think to myself about it. Yeah, I don't think I... I don't, I don't know if I've properly processed it for me and how it makes me feel. Obviously, I want to make sure I know how my partner feels. If, if I had a choice, I would 100% never, ever choose to do that to someone while I was asleep. If I, if I could 
take a pill that would get rid of that insomnia, I'd, I'd do it straight away. I gain nothing from it um, except for all this this guilt and the shame and it having to be a part of my life that doesn't benefit, at, at, at best, it doesn't benefit me in any way. At worst, it hurts somebody else. I would absolutely um, get rid of it if I could. I really want to thank you for today. It's really been so eye-opening to have your perspective on all of this. I'm so glad. I'm really glad that I can help. It kind of just shines a light to me that this is something that is real and that's something that should be taken seriously. Hearing what he experiences on a regular basis, this, like, repeated pattern of these episodes, um, kind of really contradicts everything that I've kind of read about myself. For me, I think it just... I, I know deep down that I don't suffer from this. How can I prove that I don't? Rich clearly has sex omnia, but I haven't experienced what he has. If I'm going to challenge the CPS decision to drop my case, I need to know what the sleep experts actually said about me. So I have received a pack. I know that the sleep reports are in there because that was the main thing that I'd requested. What exactly in this document is so strong to have a whole case dropping? Because this is basically what's closed the case. OK, this looks interesting. Could Jade McCrossan have caught, had an ex episode of sex on the air? A history of sleepwalking, even if only once, would establish a predisposition to sex on the air. I find that absurd. I, I can't... For this thing, like this sex on the air episode to have happened once, Surely there had been like a few red flags in my history of sharing beds with people. I don't see how this can just be like a one isolated incident that just so happens to be the time that somebody who I would never have consented to have sex with has sex with me. Her behaviour would have been of someone actively engaging in the sexual activity with eyes open and showing pleasure. a sex on the episode. Would they have considered, like, his statements in this? Did he say that my eyes were open? Did he say that I was enjoying that sexual activity when I have no recollection of it and no... not having the ability to consent to it? My brain is muddled and I don't... I was hoping for further clarity. I was hoping that these reports and this information from them would, like, give me... I don't know, a bit of peace of mind, maybe, I don't know, a better understanding of it all, but I don't, from what I've seen just looking through now, I don't feel as if I've got any more clarity. I feel, if anything, it's probably made it worse. I... If I'm going to prove the CPS should have taken my case to court, I need all the evidence I can get. The sleep clinic I visited agreed to run some tests, and tonight's the night. <laughs> oh, God. I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm so not sleepy now. It'll be a few weeks until I get the results. Meanwhile, I've been researching as much as I can. I found some rape cases where the defendant claimed to have sex somnia, but a jury decided they were lying. I definitely feel that this specific case is like the creme de la creme of bullshit in the defense world of, of sex somnia. Sex somnia soldier who dodged rape trial after claiming he was sleepwalking later attacked two women. Joseph Short was jailed for 11 years. So not only did he get hit over the head with a lamp and claim to still be asleep, he's now claiming to still be asleep, cycling after the second woman after she managed to escape his home after being raped. 
it seems too easy, in my opinion, that you can just come up with this. I think it'd be incredibly interesting to speak to, to some of the victims in relation to this case, 100%. I'm going to meet Marie. She was dating Joseph Short when he raped her. It was one night, we were both asleep and just woke up in the middle of the night to him on top of me um, and he was sort of strangling me. So I couldn't scream, I couldn't shout, I couldn't, I, I was more worried about him killing me than anything else. When he woke up in the morning, it was like nothing had happened. So I sort of said to him, like, this happened, like you attacked me in the middle of the night. And he said, oh, no, I have no recollection of it. I, I have a sleep disorder. When the police were investigating him after my statement, they put him on bail. And while he was on bail, he attacked another woman. He got on a bike and started chasing her on a bike and apparently claimed sex on the up. <laughs> it's just madness. It's just mad. You know, I've been raped. Other women have been by the same person in the same way, with the same defence being used every single time. It took four people, it, yeah. four women. Just like the sheer relief of getting that guilty verdict, not just for me, but for all the other women. It was just amazing. And knowing that he was being sent away for such a long time as well, I felt like I'd been heard. I just hugely feel for you, because you might not get that. Hopefully you will, but just keep on fighting the good fight. It kind of makes me feel sick to the stomach that that could have all been avoided. Marie could have not been raped if the justice system was actually functioning in the first instance, and that that rapist didn't get away with, with the sex on the defense. From what I understand, it's something that can be so easily manipulated in the courts, and that is really scary. It's kind of reignited that passion to, to continue fighting and just know that as a survivor or a victim, like, you're not alone. My sleep tests have been analysed and I'm on my way to get the results. Two sleep experts have already said it's possible I had an attack of sexomnia, so I'm feeling nervous about what I might hear. We're now here to talk about your results. One thing we have found is that you've got mild sleep apnea, but you also have a lot of snoring in your sleep. The fact that you've got sleep apnea will point towards you having a trigger factor for sexomnia. So could it be one isolated episode in a quiet storm of events? Yes. Can we completely rule it out? Oh, the answer is no. There's no history of sexomnia, and there's no clinical history of sexomnia. Can you give me, like, a, an idea of the probability that that happened? That is the billion-dollar question. We can't. So there is a shortage of proper scientific study in this, right? So we cannot give a definitive probability. That would be misleading. Wanting a definitive black-and-white answer, yes or no, was it or wasn't it, is not going to happen because no-one knows exactly what happened that night. I have been looking back at previous rape cases and sexomnia has become increasingly more common as a line of defence. And there are lots of lawyers <laughs> the out there trying to get business out of it. That's why I've, Indeed. I, I don't do many cases any longer. Do you ever worry that you get it wrong? We're not getting it right or wrong. What we're saying is these, this is the body of evidence for this. This is the body of evidence against it. It's for the juries to get it right and wrong. It's a shame it never got that far because of the well, exactly. CVS, indeed. Exactly, exactly. Do you think sleep experts who give medical legal opinions are arguably like supporting an industry around the sex omnia defence? The ones who are enabling it are the ones who are advertising that they can get you off. The sleep experts are not the target. We are providing an opinion on information given to us. What Dr. Abraham said is starting to sink in. He can't rule out the possibility that I had an attack of sexomnia. 
If no sleep expert can ever rule that out, how am I ever going to prove my case shouldn't have been dropped? I've been holding on to that hope. It's what's been keeping me going. It's a real big, huge mess in my head. These specialists have come to this conclusion that my have just don't. I just don't have it. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm never going to know explicitly what happened. This is affecting every part of my life. As hard as I try, it feels like everything is stacked against me. How can the justice system allow this to happen? So I've been looking online um, and actually like come across actual websites of solicitors um, with like dedicated web pages to the defense sex omnia. So on this website, there is like a dedicated web page, which is the title is Sex Omnia Defense Successful. The client was found not guilty. I find it like really, really troubling. I'm going to meet a barrister who's defended in two sex omnia trials. I want to know if some lawyers are potentially manipulating this defence. Essentially, um, I do have concerns for um, people perhaps misusing sex yes. omnia as a line of defence. I mean, I have seen it kind of almost glorified and advertised on some solicitors' websites as an almost get-out-of-jail-free card. Um, do you think that that kind of line of defence is being kind of abused within the system? But I think you're, you're right. There are certain firms of solicitors that are 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 advertising their their expertise in this particular area, um, but I would like to think that that most lawyers behave in a, a more reputable way and properly explore issues that they should be exploring as as part of their duty um, to to their to their client. From my experience of sleep experts. They, they, I haven't really been given like a definitive diagnosis. It's always merely a possibility. Yes, I, I don't think you, you will ever get a sleep expert, or, or indeed any other expert in, in this area, that will say, um, you know, this is a clear-cut case of sexomnia. Sometimes they will say it's, it's fairly neutral, you know, it's very difficult, it's possible. All right, it's possible. From a defence point of view, possible is... is, is Perhaps enough. One of the things that I will sometimes say to a jury, members of the jury, you've heard those experts, both of them have said it's entirely possible that that man was asleep and had no control over his, his actions. And if that's a real possibility, it means you can't exclude it. And it's a very fundamental part of our system that if the prosecution bring a case, they really have to prove it, and they have to prove it so a jury is sure, because that's the safeguard. Mm. And the reality, and, and I'm often asked this, do I think as a result of that that some guilty people get off, are acquitted? The answer is yes, I do. But I generally come back to the point that I would rather that be the case than we're convicting people of serious offences that are genuinely not guilty. It completely makes sense, and I could get your, I completely understand your perspective, but it is a hard pill to swallow. You hope that that process, that criminal trial process, will enable those genuine cases to be pulled out from those less genuine. But is there a guarantee that that will always happen? I'm afraid there isn't. I'm afraid there isn't. It seems like the sex omni defence could definitely be open to manipulation. But the barrister told me that the courtroom is where that should be judged. It still feels unjust that my case never made it that far. I have one final chance to question the CPS lawyers who decided to drop my case before I submit my appeal. They didn't want to go on camera, but they've agreed to speak to me. 
I feel like I got a little bit more ammunition to kind of challenge him a little bit more about it. Last time the meeting just went around in circles. It was very like frustrating. So hopefully this time I should actually get some answers. And four minutes to go. Hey, good morning. I'll start with like some sleep specialist related questions. It's not a clear diagnosis. How can that mere suggestion be enough to close an entire rape case that you guys have invested a lot of time and money in? Shouldn't have this been put to a jury to decide rather than being ultimately decided by the people in this meeting? It's not just about what happened in my case. I think for me, this is what's moving forward. Like this should have been like extensively looked into like, cause this is gonna be a precedent. And I, I felt like if you guys did everything you guys could do, I would have felt at least, okay, these guys have done their job. I'm happy with that. I feel proud that our criminal justice system has done as much as they can, but I don't feel like that has happened in this case. I don't think it was challenged enough. Take care, bye-bye. <sighs> Fuck's sake. They kind of really stuck to their guns when it came to, this was our case theory, this undermined our case theory, end of. My mood now is that I'm completely fired up, I'm ready to take everything on. So I'm gonna be putting forward my victim's right to review, kind of show to them that I'm not going down quietly about this. After all the people I've spoken to and everything I've learnt, I'm ready to submit my appeal. The CPS will now look over everything in my case again. It's been a difficult few months waiting for the result. So I've just got back from work. I've, um... I've had my decision from the Victim's Right to Review and the Chief Crown Prosecutor that has reviewed my case has um, pretty outrightly said that he doesn't agree with the decision of it being closed and marked as no evidence and that it should have been seen in front of a jury. How can I be let down? and How can a rapist walk free based on the CPS's mishandling and misjudgment of this case? and them actively now acknowledging that it is wrong. They know it and they've said it. I just can't believe that they've, they've acknowledged it. It's hard to accept, but I've been told there's just no way forward for my case. Because it was closed completely, the law says it cannot be reopened. But I know now that I'll never have my day in court, so I need to find my own way of putting all this behind me. As soon as I had my clothes back, I felt like I had to do something more with them. I couldn't just have them back, I needed to do something. And so I have decided that I'm gonna burn the underwear and the bags. And I've invited my two best friends to come with me. Um, they were there that night, they were at the party um, that we went to. They were there before my world was turned upside down and for me it represents an end. I'm reclaiming my life back. Let's go. 
going. <laughs> it's actually going. Seeing it just go is great. I do feel that this is the end of the process for me. Like this, my journey ends here. Like there's, there's no, there's no hope of any, any justice for what happened to me. But I, I have grown as a person. Fuck, it does feel good. They're gone. I thought I was going to cry, but I don't think there's sadness. I think it's just... Relief, almost? Relief. Thanks, girls. <laughs> <laughs>